Welcome to another episode of Fear the Old Lore, where we examine the English and Japanese versions of FromSoft titles to gain a better understanding of the lore. In this episode, we'll examine the source of the Old Blood and Bloodborne, its connections to the Hanged Men, Stagnation, and the Hunter's Rune. Warning. Spoilers ahead. Commonly held beliefs will be challenged. For additional context, it may be beneficial to watch my videos about the Old Blood, Biobloods, and the Dark of Dark Souls before watching this one. Let's begin. One common question about Bloodborne is, where does the blood come from? Many people assume it comes from the Great One since it would explain why the blood has supernatural powers, but this overlooks critical information about it. The blood gets its power from blood echoes, which are the left behind wills, dreams, and desires of the dead. The reason we can say this is that they're called Chi no Ishi in Japanese. It would be kind of awkward to attain the dying wills of blood from each defeated enemy though, so I think the localizers made an elegant choice of going with blood echoes. It works well as a translation if you already understand the context of what it alludes to, but it also makes it more difficult to pick up on how blood echoes are meant to be related to the dead. This in turn plays into why so many would think blood echoes come from great ones instead of the wills of the deceased. Additionally, with blood echoes being called Shino Ishi in Japanese, there's a potential play on words with the term Ishii being a homophone that shares the same pronunciation with Ishii as in willpower. With the HP stat described as the will to survive, and the doll's Japanese dialogue about transforming blood echoes to embolden our Ishii or will instead of our sickly spirit, it's meant to be understood that the hunter can augment their will to live and survive with the wills of the dead. It isn't explained directly how hunters absorb the wills of the dead, but the general idea can be gained from the air rune which says a hunter bears the echoing will of those before him. As they hunt and absorb the blood echoes of their prey, hunters inherit their will to carry on. The spirits of the dead are likely attracted to hunters, which might explain why blood echoes are obtained automatically, and there are two pieces of information which justify this claim in a roundabout way. The first comes from messengers. According to the doll, they're drawn toward, yearn for, and serve hunters. Their appearances alone could suggest messengers are related to spirits of the dead, but in another linguistic play in words that gets lost in translation, shisha as in messenger can be pronounced the same as shisha for deceased person. With messengers most likely being spirits of the dead, they may be meant to be representations of blood echoes since they're what appear after we've been transfused blood in the opening cutscene. The second example comes from how wills are treated in Dark Souls. When spells like Homing Soul Mass and Pursuers or Affinity are granted wills of their own, they become drawn towards life out of feelings of love, envy, and hatred. The messengers are likely no different, and they're drawn towards the player out of a desire to live vicariously again through them. The dead's desire for life is what sustains hunters' wills to survive, and thus, when the people of Yarnum imbibe blood, they gain a literal high on life that's more intoxicating than alcohol. One of the issues with imbibing the blood is that while its powers can be considered holy and miraculous, by the same token it can be considered impure and profane since it's essentially gained through cannibalizing the dead. As such, normal people cannot withstand its effects for long, and it can cause them to go mad or transform into grotesque beasts. In fact, it seems the ones most able to withstand the blood's effects are called inhuman, as evidenced by how Alfred refers to the vile bloods, or how the Tumerian chalices describe the Tumerians as inhuman in Japanese, or superhuman in English. This falls in line with the progression we can see in Cold Blood. The more blood echoes it has, the closer it becomes to the cosmically nightmarish Great Ones. It seems the more one absorbs the blood, the more advanced and less human they become. And according to game director Hidetaka Miyazaki's Drained of Blood interview, the more advanced or developed a being or civilization becomes, the more its birth rate declines, and in the case of the Great Ones, they have become unable to bear children. Even the Tumerians and Loranites had issues producing children of their own, and the bastards of Loran and red jellies found throughout the dungeons can be taken as evidence of their inability to properly reproduce as a consequence of imbibing blood. So if the blood can elevate people beyond humanity and bring them closer to the level of Great Ones, this raises the question, where did the blood originally come from? Many people believe a brightest star of the cosmos is the source of the healing church's blood but it should be noted that the Great Eyes Chalice mentions the Healing Church didn't have audience with her until the time of the choir. This would have occurred relatively late in the timeline, since the choir came from the Orphanage and the Healing Church had already been using blood for quite some time. Additionally, 
There's no medical equipment next to Brightus to suggest the healing church was harvesting blood from her. One could make the argument that Tumerians harvested the blood from her originally, but it would still overlook how blood echoes come from the dead. So instead of Great One blood, the Tumerians may have been harvesting blood and blood echoes from the bodies of the deceased. But this wouldn't explain why supernatural blood seems to be endemic only to Yarnum. If any old corpse blood had healing properties or could transform people into beasts, then why would Yarnum's blood be any different? The answer to that may come from what we can learn from comparing what we know of the Tumerians to what we know of the vile bloods of Canehurst. From Annalise, we learn Canehurst would funnel blood jugs to their blood queen in the hope that she would bear a child of blood. The blood rapture rune mentions it resonated with servants of the queen, carry out the child of blood, yet the shadows of Yarnum drop it. From this, we can extrapolate that blood dregs were probably also given to Yarnum so she could bear a child of blood. Blood dregs come from cold blood in the blood of Echo Fiends or Hunters, but if Garamond is the canonical first hunter, it raises questions of where the Tumerians ultimately obtained their blood. It's bothered me for a while, but throughout the Tumerian Chalice Dungeons there are a number of graves and doors that have the Hunter's Rune inscribed onto them. It wouldn't make much sense for the Tumerians to worship the symbol of the Hunters if Garamond was the first one, so it suggests the Hunter's Rune likely meant something different to the Tumerians than it does to the people of Yarnum. As always, I'd like to be clear the following is speculation. Throughout the dungeons, and even the headstones in the Hunter's Dream, we can see a kind of progression in the shape of the Hunter's Mark over time. While the final version resembles an upside-down Algae's rune, its other iterations more closely resemble that of a hanged man. The resemblance becomes self-evident when compared to some of the corpses that can be found strung up throughout the game. So if hunters as we know them weren't around during the time of Tumaru, would it mean the Tumerians revered the bodies of hanged men instead? If so, why? After death, Blood stops flowing throughout the body, and red blood cells, by virtue of being heavier than plasma, will begin clotting and sinking through the body in a process called liver mortis. Unlike normal blood, which clots when found in cold dead bodies, cold blood doesn't clot, and it's possible the Tumerians may have discovered it in hanged men and started consuming it for themselves. If this blood contained blood echoes, they likely would have gotten a high on life and been driven to gather more of it ultimately leading to the degradation of their civilization. There is a fairly large theme throughout FromSoft games of stagnation leading to impurity, and impurity being linked to the profane. It arises from Shinto beliefs relating to the flow of nature. For example, flowing bodies of water were thought to remain pure by washing away their impurities, whereas stagnant pools allowed mosquitoes and other kinds of vermin and insects to breed and proliferate. This fluid metaphor is integral to understanding some of the hidden mechanics of the game, and the overall principle is similar to the proverb, blood is thicker than water. Since it's thicker, blood will pool in the bottom of stagnant water, and if we apply the principle further, things like the impurities within blood and quicksilver would sink even further. This is the general idea blood dregs come from, and it relates to the various sea and lake runes which meant to indicate that the supernatural is encountered beyond the depths of water, and is what the various patients of the research hall experience. A corpse can be equated to a body that's become stagnant, and once the heart stops pumping blood, the heaviest parts of the blood, its impurities, would sink to the bottom. This may be the idea where blood dregs come from, and could help explain why hanged men are associated with the Hunter's Mark, Blood Echoes, and why some even have bags over their hands in places like Old Yarnum. The earliest Tumerians probably weren't exposed to a large amount of the blood for a few reasons. First, the potency of it probably wasn't very high if it came from regular humans, and second, even if they did collect blood, they probably didn't imbibe it themselves, and funneled it to their queen instead, who would then disseminate it back down to her servants in what I like to call a form of literal trickle-down economics. Thus, it may have taken generations of gradually funneling the blood to their queen before it came to have the potency of what we see in Yarnum. Over time, this altered the physiology of the Tumerians to the point they can no longer be considered human. To those unaccustomed to it, the Tumerians would have superhuman blood and they wouldn't be able to withstand its effects for long. This could have potentially led to the outbreak of illness and beasthood within Lorien, and why so many people in Yarnum transform into beasts. While the people of Canehurst also transformed, it should be noted that their transformations don't resemble those of traditional beasts, and the blood lickers and lost bastards of antiquity can be found in the Chalice Dungeons. Additionally, 
There are no regular beast type enemies in the Temerian Chalice dungeon variants. Though it can keep people alive, imbibing the blood probably brings them closer to the dead and death. If messengers really are the spirits of the dead within blood, it's worth noting how much Temerians resemble them. Of course, their appearances could also be due to staying underground for so long, but the wandering pilgrims and bound women of Canerist also show the blood's ability to keep things alive beyond the grave. Virtually everything in Bloodborne points to blood and death. I'd venture so far to say the blood's power ultimately comes from the kinds of souls within it, but nothing's so cut and dry. If the power of the soul is tied to one's willpower, then perhaps by having a strong will one can remain conscious even while they sleep. And in the case of the Great Ones, they retain their consciousness even should they die. It seems having an incredibly strong will is enough to blur the lines of reality. With all this being said, one could still make the argument that the supernatural elements of the blood come from a different Great One like the formless Odin. But with the hunter able to transform into a Great One themselves in the third ending of the game, and most characters lack of knowledge of the world they live in, it's made me wonder. Are the Great Ones great because it's in their nature? Or were they all formerly human, and it's the blood that's made them so? No matter your position, with the hunter able to face the Great Ones, Bloodborne and other FromSoft titles make it clear that success is granted only to those with the drive to make their wills a reality. Another interesting possibility regarding the source of the blood's power is that it could have been imbued with special cosmic power through universal symbols in the form of carol runes. When we look at the dangling upside down symbol of the hunter's mark, not only is it reminiscent of hanged men, but it's also present in the crucifixes used on beasts that can be found throughout Yarnum and the hunter's dream. Additionally, the crucifixes the church servants carry in the cathedral ward can also inflict frenzy on the player, suggesting the symbol itself has a special kind of power, though it is possible their weapons have been altered in some unknown way. It's probably unlikely, but perhaps putting hanged men in this dangling upside down position was more likely to produce potent blood. Either way, with hunters not existing until the time of Bergenworth, the most likely explanation for the hunter's mark being found in the Chalice Dungeons is that it's meant to represent hanged men and the blood echoes that can be obtained from them. It would help explain why the burials of Yarnum were considered blasphemous, why so many corpses are suspended from the ceilings in the Chalice Dungeons, and why the hunter's mark is used to represent blood echoes in the UI. Nonetheless, even if one were to disagree and still argue the blood comes from Great Ones, I hope this video will broaden and enrich the discussion surrounding the game. Because this information isn't found in item descriptions, it should be treated with a hefty amount of skepticism, and I don't expect everyone to agree. But just because the game deals with the unknown, it doesn't make it unknowable. Fear the Old Lore Thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it. Please consider liking and subscribing to the channel for more content in the future.